Hello. All right. Uh, good, ev uh, good evening. Good morning. My evenings and my mornings are all messed up. Good morning, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, verse 18? Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. And also in your songbooks, we're going to break out a, Christ a couple of Christmas songs today. Uh, we're going to do... Um, what's, what page is it? Page 57, Cheyenne says. Hark the herald angels sing. And we'll probably do Joy to the World after that. I might just do that too. We'll see. So keep that in mind. Joy to the world in that. But first one will be Hark the Herald Angels. Yeah, joy to the World's on page 92. So Hark the Herald Angels sing and then Joy to the World for congregational songs. And uh, just a reminder, we have uh, for class schedule, uh, we'll be taking our ne next Sunday as our final class before the, uh, the Christmas break. And uh, so... Uh, that's next Sunday, and uh, what we'll do is we, we'll re resume classes. I get, um, we'll we resume classes in January. We'll be missing two Sunday classes, January 1st, and also Christmas falls on uh, Sunday, Sunday as well. But we'll resume classes J uh, Sunday, January 8th. So the last class before the break is next Sunday, and then we have re we resume classes, meet again on uh, Sunday, January 8th. And for those who might be new to the ministry through listening on the internet, um, the, the class schedule here is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings from uh, 7 to 8 p.m. We have a prayer meeting at the end of class on Thursday. Our internet people join us at that time. Sunday mornings, it's usually we're 9 to a quarter past 10, 10.30 if we're doing the Lord's Supper. And we have a, a, a prayer meeting at the end of our brunch that Jody puts, uh, prepares for us after service. So if you're in the Cedar Rapids area or Marion area, uh, you can... Um, you can come in, you can get, get fed uh, not only spiritual food, but uh, a natural food from Jody. So anyways, uh, uh, and also we don't have our, our, people might be wondering if our address is not on the website because we're meeting in a home. We meet in the Thompson's home, so I don't really like to put the street address out there unless, we, uh, so therefore my phone number is there, so you can call me and I'll, we'll give you the street address if you want to, if you're in the area and you'd like to attend. So uh, that's the class schedule, and I think that's about it for uh, announcements. And um, you should be at Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. And also you should have my translation in front of you of that uh, passage as well. And uh, I think uh, that's it for the announcements. So let's take a moment of silent prayer. As is our custom, we take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. Remember, confession of sin, according to 1 John 1, 9, restores us to fellowship with God, and we... We need to maintain that fellowship by obeying the Word of God. And when we do that, we're obeying the Holy Spirit. Because remember, the Holy Spirit uh, inspired the Scriptures, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. And also, He speaks through the communication of the Word of God by the pastor. He speaks through the pastor the Word of God. Of course, the pastor's got to make sure that he's uh, interpreting accurately the Scriptures himself and paying attention to, to sound interpretive uh, uh, principles. So... Uh, uh, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning that you've given to us. We thank you, Father, for another day to study your word, to have fellowship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with each other. We thank you for not only those who are in the Thompson home this morning, but others that might be viewing or listening to this class live right now through the website or at a later date, through the recordings on the website. We thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson and their hospitality and opening up their home to us four days a week and the sacrifices that they make. We thank you for Titus' work with the sound and the recordings, the video, the audio. We pray that you give him wisdom in that area this morning. We thank you for his service and the technology and the people taking advantage of the technology. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and help us to remember at this time of year when we celebrate your son, uh, his birth, his becoming a human being 2,000 years ago. Help us to uh, keep things in perspective and remind, uh, remind us of the reason for the season, why we celebrate this time and not get caught up in the commercialism of uh, our culture, 
where uh, you're, the, uh, Christmas is being commercialized and we just help us to uh, put things in perspective and have our priorities straight as we enter into this time of bringing into remembrance the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, the incarnation of the Son of God. Father, we also pray that this morning that you would help everyone in the audience to understand what is being taught by the pastor, by the power of the Spirit, help them to do this. Please break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up that would hinder that from happening. We also pray that you would empower me as the communicator to bring forth your full counsel to your people with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power, being sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction as well so that your people can be built up and edified spiritually and ultimately you and your son glorified as a result of all of us applying uh, what we're learning in our, stu in our study here this morning. We also pray that you'd help us with the song service, help us to sing by the power of the Spirit, these songs that we'll be uh, singing this morning and, and as an expression of worship of you and your son. And we pray, Father, for this in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, could you all rise, please? Hark the Herald Angel. And that's page 57. Do uh, joy to the world. And that's page 92. <laughs> joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven, nature, sing. And heaven, nature, sing. And he heaven in heaven, and nature, sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let man 
their songs and boy while fields and floods rocks and hills and plain repeat the sounding joy repeat the sounding joy keep repeat the sounding joy of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love joy to the world the Lord has come let it receive her King let every sing and heaven and nature sing and he heaven and heaven and nature sing you may be seated hey see you later buddy I'm biting everything today Okay, you should be uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, please. Colossians 3, 18. This morning we're continuing uh, our study of the household code, the code of conduct that should be, taking, uh, that should be uh, manifesting itself in the homes of Christians in the Colossian Christian community. Uh, we've been, it start, this section began in Colossians 3, 18, and it ends at Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. The Net Bible, as I pointed out in the past, has done a good job of putting verse 1 with these verses because they, they go together. They're one paragraph. They're a pericope, we call it. So what we see is uh, this morning, we're going to look at verse 23, where Paul talks to this, the slaves in the Colossian Christian community, and he and, uh, tells them that they must continue to work hard as for the Lord and never for people. Uh, this is actually going to amplify what he said in verse 17 a little bit. And uh, we're going to see, uh, it also uh, explains emphatically the command in verse 22. If you recall, uh, verse 22, uh, the Apostle Paul was saying that they are to obey, the slaves are to obey their masters on earth. And uh, he, not with the external surf, services, those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, worshiping the Lord through their godly conduct and obedient conduct to their slave masters. So we're, we're, what we're seeing here is, and we'll continue to develop this, and we put it out in the past, the, the Christian's union identification with Christ has transformed all his relationships. In the first century, it transformed the relationship between slave and slave masters uh, because it gave serve, uh, sla slavery, un it, uh, because of it, it was supposed to be done in, in, uh, as a as a outgrowth or as a manifestation of uh, experiencing your identification with Christ, having fellowship with him, it transformed that relationship because now slaves with their menial, many of them having menial tasks or, you know, because they had no freedom and they were, had no rights, no political power, nothing, and they were the property of some other person, uh, it transformed that situation to them. And, and, and by uh, what it did was it, it, uh, the, the apostolic teaching taught these slaves that, you know, now their service is for the Lord Jesus Christ. They're actually ultimately, and this is true of every believer in Jesus Christ, in union with him. We're all slaves of Christ Jesus to start with. So we're all servants uh, because of that union identification with Christ. We're all servants of Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is, now he, even though he's talking to slaves in the Roman Empire in the first century, 
There is an application for us, uh, for Christian employees and employers. Uh, employees, uh, we should, the, what Paul says to the slaves here, we should be following ourselves. We should be obeying our bosses on earth, not with external service as those who merely please people, but with sincerity of heart. And we should show our worship, worship the Lord through our obedience to our bosses and being uh, conscientious, hardworking people in our jobs so that uh, we might maybe lead some of these people uh, that we work for to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ or the people we work with. And so uh, we're going to see today, Paul says, whatever you do, do you work heartily as for the Lord rather than for people? And that's how we as Christian employee, uh, employees should uh, be doing. We should be doing everything at work as for the Lord. In fact, everything we do in life, doesn't matter what it is. If it's doing work at home, you're a housewife, or you're shoveling the driveway, or you're cleaning the bathrooms in your home, or whatever you're doing in life, you're a pastor of a church, uh, you should do everything as unto the Lord. And, and with 100% effort, and being aware of the fact that you will ultimately get rewarded for your faithfulness. Because if you notice, as we'll see in a minute, uh, in verse uh, 24, Paul in verses 25, there's going to be a reward of the inheritance if these slaves do their job as unto the Lord and with 100% effort, at knowing that they're going to receive a reward at the Bama seat from the Lord Jesus Christ for their faithful service. So it doesn't matter what you're doing in life. If you're faithful, as God calls you to do this job, if you're faithful, you will get rewarded at the Bama seat if you're doing it as and, 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 and doing your do, uh, exerting effort as to him as as if you're serving him and you are serving him that's the reality you're look yeah you're serving your human employer but in reality you're serving the lord jesus christ so we this is something that is very applicable to us because we talk about uh getting the gospel out to people well who are the people you round all the time you spend most of your time, really, if you, outside of your family, you spend a lot of time at work. You know, some of you work 40, 50, 60 hours a week, and you're around the people you work on, the people you work for quite a bit. So your way you do your job, your con being conscientious, it says, a, and being hardworking, it says a lot about who you are. And if you're conscientious and hardworking in your job and doing your job in obedience to the Lord, uh, this is a great testimony. So we, you've heard me say this. There's a lot of Christians who I call bumper sticker Christian. They put the bumper stickers on, and they're they, you know, saying that they're a Christian, but they're terrible in their job. They're terrible and not conscientious. They complain at work. They backstab the boss. They're no different than their non-Christian uh, people at work. And so they're, they're a terrible, terrible testimony, and they're not going to lead anybody to the Savior. Uh, with that kind of bad performance in their job. So this should transform our union identification with Christ. It should transform the relationship that we have with our employers, just like it did transform the relationship between the Christian slaves and their slave masters in the first century. Very, very important subject here this morning. So if you could, look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, please, in your Bibles. And I'll read from the Net Bible. Colossians 3.18, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children so that they will not become disheartened. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in every respect, not only when they're watching like those who are strictly people pleasers, but with a sincere heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you're doing, work at it with enthusiasm, as to the Lord and not for people, because you know that you will receive your inheritance from the Lord as the reward. See that? Serve the Lord Christ, for the one who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, meaning you're not doing your job as under the Lord, and there are no exceptions. Masters, treat your slaves with justice and fairness, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. There's one, as we saw last week in Ephesians chapter 6, I think it's verses 5 through 9, uh, Paul echoes what he said to the Ephesian Christian community, or to the Colossian Christian community here in Colossians 3, 18 through 4, 1. He echoes it in, to the Ephesian Christian community in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 
through 9. And so uh, there's many other places where, other places where Paul talks uh, to uh, Timothy or Titus with regard to the conduct of the slaves in the Colossian, uh, the, their Christian communities that they were overseeing. Uh, Titus chapter 2 verses 9 and 10, Paul gives instructions to Titus with regards to the slaves in the Cretan Christian community. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 1 and 2, he gives instructions to Timothy with regards to the, Ephes the slaves in the Ephesian Christian community and that particular epistle to Timothy. And in all of these things, we see that the uh, that we see that you you never see the apostles telling you know get away, get get rid of slavery ab abolish it and uh, they didn't do that and the reason why as we we saw last week and, and times past when we did Philemon uh, we see that if we if we communicate the gospel and live the gospel out in our lives like the slaves in the in the Christian community did in the first century that will uh, cause it actually caused slave masters to become Christians. And then eventually free their slaves, give them their freedom. And this was all without a civil war like we had in our country. It was without violence. So uh, the polit uh, we see today, Christians today, they, they, a lot of the social problems, that, and, and slavery was a, a major institution, and it was a social problem to a certain extent, and a great extent in the Roman Empire in the first century, but the way that the apostles dealt with it is they, they communicated the gospel, they taught their people to live out the gospel in their lives, and within a couple of centuries, Christianity was declared the state religion, which was a problem itself by Constantine in the 300s and AD, and then slavery was gone by then too, without any civil war. You know, we removed slavery in our country in the 18s, between the eight, in the 1800s, middle of the 1800s, but it was a civil war that was a result. It was more issues with regards to that war anyway, states' rights and all that, but the civil, the, the slavery was done away with at that point. And, uh, and it still uh, was had lingering effects into the 1960s, and you had the civil rights movement in that country. But if you, but what was happening is the, the, the solution to the way Paul dealt with this, the problem of slavery was the, to communicate the gospel and to have his people live it out. And it transformed the, 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 the Roman Empire. And so this was, that's quite, so, and it's not just uh, uh, Christians who teach this about the, uh, the, you know, the apostles teaching about slavery in the first century. Uh, secular writers point out how Christianity transformed Rome and Rome was, uh, slavery was gone within a couple of centuries of, of the apostles walking the earth in the first century. So what we see here is a, is a, a fantastic passage which is actually a great encouragement to people who are in subordinate relationships, whether you're a wife or you're a, 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 a subordinate to your husband or children to your parents or you're a slave uh, with, in relation to your slave master, you could, do, you could get rewarded at the Bama seat by simply being faithful to the Lord in those rela human relationships and those circumstances that you find yourself in. So in other words, you can't use your circumstances, your bad circumstances as an excuse for being unfaithful. Uh, you're, you're the gospel allows you to rise above, be transcendent of your bad circumstances, bad situations. In fact, this was true with Paul because when he wrote Philippians, when he wrote Ephesians, when he wrote Colossians, when he wrote Philemon, he was in prison for the cause of Christ unjustly. And yet you never hear him complain whatsoever. Just continue to pro proclaim the gospel. So Colossians 3.23 is our verse here this morning. It says, whatever you do, uh, whatever you're doing, work at it with enthusiasm as to the Lord, he says. And let me give you some of the translations of that verse. Uh, the ESV, uh, they, uh, they translate verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. The Good News translation uh, renders this verse, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord and not the human beings. I like the uh, Good News translation quite a bit in a lot of places. Lexham Bible. Uh, whatever you do, accomplish it from the soul as to the Lord and not for people. Today's NIV, uh, we have whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. The, the New American Standard, they tra translate this verse, whatever you do, do you work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men? So pretty much they're all in a, uh, in pretty close to each other. Now, in, uh, what's interesting, and uh, not translated uh, by any of these really trans uh, these translations is the, is the conditional particle aeon. Uh, it's, uh, usually it's translated if or sometimes when. Uh, I'm going to translate it whenever here, and I think some of the translations kind of 
they're not bad, they're good, but uh, this word, uh, it's uh, actually introducing uh, uh, the pronosis of a third class condition, which is expressing a spiritual principle. They call it in Greek grammar a fifth class condition, meaning this is presenting a spiritual principle, this verse. That's what this word is introducing. And it's telling that the slaves and the, that everything that the slaves in the Colossian Christian community do in life must be done as for the Lord Jesus rather than for their human master. So this is an, a principle, a spiritual principle, or we could say a spiritual axiom that is being presented to the Colossian Christian community, the slaves, and thus us here in the 21st century, here in Colossians 3.23. When he says, you do, it's the word poiel. Poiel, it means to perform, to act, to accomplish a particular activity or activities on behalf of another person. It's correctly translated here. Here it denotes any activity, any activity whatsoever performed by these slaves, which benefits their human slave masters. Now, the second person plural form of this verb is speaking of the Colossian slaves, the slaves in the Colossian Christian community, as a corporate unit. It's in the plural form. That means it means all of you. But it's also used in a distributive sense, meaning each of you are to do your work heartily as for the Lord. No exceptions. He wants every slave in the Colossian Christian community to be, to be uh, obeying this principle. The present tense is, uh, the, of this verb is what we call a gnomic present. It's used to describe that's, uh, something that's true anytime and does take place rather than expressing a, a universal statement that is true all the time or a spiritual axiom, which it often does. Here, this would indicate that when, whenever these slaves at any time do something. They must continue to make it their habit of doing it from the perspective that what they're doing is ultimately for the Lord Jesus rather than from the perspective that what they're doing is for their, for their uh, human slave masters. So here is another thing with thinking. He's, this thing, what Paul's saying here is you got to have the perspective that what you're doing is not merely for your human slave master. It's for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've heard me say this before in the past. Everything is perspective in life. Everything, in your attitude, is, and your control of your attitude. Uh, you, can't, you can't let, uh, you know, so many times this happens to us. We become a slave to people and circumstances, at meaning when we get a bad situation or we get something not go our way, uh, we have a tendency to start feeling depressed and let's say something does something, somebody does something to us that we don't like, and all of a sudden we go into a bad mood or a bad fit, a fit of depression, what happens is we're allowing that person and that circumstance to, to be, uh, we're slaves to them now, because now they can control our happiness by the way, way they treat us, and so we get into this depression, we get so worked up. God doesn't want us to be a slave to people and circumstances. We, he wants us to be obedient to him, knowing that he's sovereign over our circumstances, he's in control, he will take care of us, he knows what our needs are, and he knows that, uh, that the circumstances you're in, he puts you in those circumstances. So everything has to be from the divine perspective, which you receive from the word of God. So he's saying to these slaves, I want whatever you do at any time, I want you to continue to do it uh, from the perspective that what you're doing is ultimately for the Lord Jesus, rather than from the perspective that what you're doing is merely for human beings. Now, when he says heartily, uh, it's a prepositional phrase in the Greek. It's nothing wrong to uh, translate it with an adverb, heartily. Uh, it, we see that the word pesuke is in this verse. It's, that's usually, uh, the, that's why some of the translations uh, translate it uh, soul. It's usually this word pesuke, it speaks of the soul. I think, uh, um, uh, the uh, let's see some of these translations have uh, have it I think it was the Lexham Bible yeah they said whatever you do accomplish it from the soul so the word pasuke is uh, and they and the word from is the word ek and they're actually translating this prepositional phrase literally which is good to do but what does he mean from the soul uh, th this word pasuke it refers to the immaterial invisible human attributes of a slave in the Colossian Christian community. That's why the, the Lexham Bible translates the word soul. And it, it, these attributes would include volition, self-consciousness, conscience, mentality, and emotion. This is what's in your soul. Now, this word speaks of one's entire being. So when he says, from the soul, which it literally means, from the soul, the idea, the idiom is, with your entire being. So whatever you're doing, in your job, 
or whatever you got you're doing in life, whether it's you know, work at home, uh, you know, work at school, uh, uh, whatever, work in your job, whatever you're doing, everything must come, every, a every attribute of your human soul, your volition, your self-conscious, your consciousness, your conscience, your mentality, the way you do your thinking, your emotions, all must be governed with, from the, uh, with, a, with the word of God from the perspective that what I'm doing here, whatever it is, I'm doing it for the Lord. All right. So, in other words, give your 100% effort is the idea here. We would say in, in the 21st century. So this word, pasuke, speaks of one's entire being. It's the object of the preposition ek, as I pointed out, which is a marker of source. And that indicates that Paul wants the slaves to continue to perform every activity in life on behalf of their masters from their entire being, we could say. Or in other words, with 100% effort. And when he says do your work, the word do your work in the Greek is ergezomai, and this word means to engage in an activity involving, it's very important, involving considerable effort, expenditure of effort, energy, and diligence. And thus it means to labor hard, to work hard, to accomplish something. So it's talking about effort here, this word. It's not the same word as earlier, poieo. This is Ergezomai, which is talking about working hard. And so it's talking about, it's emphasizing the effort involved in the work. So the present imperative form of this verb is a customary and present imperative, which is expressing the idea of these slaves continuing to make it their habit of working hard from the perspective that what they're doing is ultimately for the benefit of the Lord Jesus. So the idea with the command is they were doing it, He's saying, I want you to continue to make it your habit. This is to be your lifestyle. I want you to continue to do this and this to be your lifestyle. Now, the middle voice of the verb is pretty interesting as well. It's an indirect middle. It means that the subject is going to act for himself or herself. That would mean it, it's for your own benefit, he's saying that you continue to make it your habit of working hard for the Lord Jesus rather than simply to please your human slave masters. So the idea is for your own benefit. In fact, if I flipped it in in the, uh, the New American Standard, the, this middle voice and translated it for you, excuse me. It says, whatever you do, do your work heartily. Or you could say, for your own benefit, do your work heartily. And the middle voice is actually saying, you're going to benefit by doing this, working hard, whatever you do. Now, how, what, the very next verse, a couple of verses tell you why. Verse 23, or 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. And then he's emphatic about and explicit what he means by what he's saying in verses, verse 23. It is the Lord Christ that they're serving. Okay, so this is exciting. You could, do, you could be in a boring job. You could be in a boring job that is not uh, up to your expectations or your, you could do a lot better and have a better job. You could have a lot uh, uh, better pay, a better, uh, more challenges, and yet you could have a, you'd be in a, stuck in a tough job. You could still do, be, have a great attitude in it because even though you're stuck in that job and God's got you stuck in that job, if you do it as under the Lord, he's going to reward you for being faithful and working hard in your job for him. So, in other words, stop looking at your job as I'm working for this guy or this woman. I'm actually working for Jesus Christ. If that's the reality. That's the true perspective. That's the divine perspective. And we'll be rewarded for that. So you could be a guy that's digging a ditch or cleaning bathrooms, okay? Some disgusting job like, you know, you're just cleaning bathroom, bathrooms. And I remember when I was a kid growing up, my dad... He used to work three jobs, I told you. He used to, be, he used to do catering. He worked for a printing ink company for years. And he did that. That was his main thing. And then he would work some nights on catering. And he, he loved that job. You know, he almost got killed doing that job. He, my mother made him quit after he almost, he was in a car accident, flipped over, and he saved the guy. Oh, the guy had got his leg crushed. And he, uh, he pulled the guy out, and he tied a tourniquet around his leg to stop the bleed. Saved the guy's life and the guy's leg. He got hurt, uh, falling out of the truck. They got cut off by some track, the trailer or something. It was like one of those milk, old milk trucks where you just fall, you could, there was an open door there. And he did that job. He did, then he worked his bowling alley job. And we used to help him. It was on Sunday mornings. After church, we'd go over there. We were Catholics. And we'd go to there and we'd clean up the bowling alley. And you know what I was doing? 
cleaning, you know, we'd get free bowling a lot of times, but I was cleaning, you know, that was when they had public smoking. We'd have to, I'd have to clean the ashtrays. Oh, disgusting. And then you had to go to clean the bathrooms, you know, and sometimes they were disgusting, you know, the bathrooms. So who was cleaning that stuff? I was doing that stuff. And I, you know, I'm sure some of you all have had tough jobs, stuff that was, uh, you know, not the greatest job in the world. And there were jobs I was in, I told you that I was in, and they were just real, I would be bored stiff. I'd be bored stiff in the job, you know. It was like, be, you know, there'd be not a lot, you know, I'd be looking at the clock and it was like, you know, I'd have my work done. It's like, okay, I'd go to my boss, you got anything else? And I'm like, so, it, it, and some of the stuff, you know, the boss was a, was a, was a pain, didn't, you know, for whatever reason, didn't like me or whatever, which is, understandable and so i would so i would just keep plugging away and i would remind myself of this do your work as on the lord because i'm going to work hard i'm going to ignore the fact that this person is boss is a pain or this job is boring and i'm not getting i'm not getting them uh i'm not uh doing something that's um, uh fulfilling me okay i was able to get through that knowing stuff like this so uh, eventually things change, you know, great thing, we're not, you know, we can change jobs in, in our day and age, and sometimes we can't get the job we, you know, we, we want, uh, but we can, we can handle that, knowing these things that Paul's teaching these slaves in the Colossian Christian community, it can transform our jobs, and so that it's not so mundane and boring, and we're, we, we're, but we're, we don't want to get up in the morning to go to this job. If we know that we're going to get a reward from the Lord for doing our job, working hard, 100% effort in our job for him, then that makes getting up in the morning a lot easier, right? Absolutely. Absolutely it does. It should, if you believe what the Word of God says. Very important things that we can have here, uh, that we can learn here from Paul, to what he says to the Colossian Christian community. So then he says, if you look at uh, Colossians 3.23, he says, Whatever you do, do you work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. The phrase, as for the Lord, indicates that these slaves must continue to maintain the perspective or attitude that working hard from their entire being for their human slave masters is in reality for the benefit of the Lord. And when he says rather than for men, he's emphasizing with these slaves that what must never be their motivation for obeying this command here in Colossians 3.23. They should be working hard, 100% effort from their entire being for the Lord and never for human beings. In other words, your perspective must be, I'm not doing this job, or whatever I'm doing now in life, could be anything, it doesn't have to be your job, it could be anything in life, shoveling the driveway, you know, uh, going to get, uh, do stuff for your parents, cleaning the bathrooms, whatever it is, it could be, and also, of course, your job. You can't be having it from the perspective that what I'm doing is merely for human beings. I'm doing it for Jesus. Everything in life is now to be, we have, must have that perspective, whatever we do in life. Now look at my translation, please, of Colossians 3.23. Please, Colossians 3.23. Colossians 3.23. Colossians 3.23, whenever any of you at any time should do something each of you from your entire being for your own benefit must continue making it your habit of working hard as for your one and only true lord indeed never for people now this fifth class conditional statement is a spiritual principle as i pointed out it asserts that when as you can see from my translation it asserts that whenever any of these slaves at any time, should do something, each of them from their entire being, for their own benefit, must continue to make it their habit of working hard as for their one and only Lord, true Lord, indeed never for people. In other words, he's saying they must always do everything in life from the perspective that what they're doing is in reality for the Lord Jesus Christ and never from the perspective that what they're doing is for their human master. Paul's not saying to the slaves that they're not to work hard for their human slave masters. You can't, don't get that. But rather he's teaching these slaves that they must adopt the view and perspective that their service for their human masters is in reality on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's teaching them that they're not only serving their human masters, but ultimately they're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his slaves. And listen to me. He was a slave too, a servant. He became, we saw last week in Philippians 2.7, a lot of the translations translate doulos, slave. 
Mark 10, 45, the son of man came not to be served. He's always oh, God, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for others. Sacrificial service, not only for the father, because it was father's plan to save us, but for us who were his enemies. So Jesus Christ is, is called, in fact, if you look at Isaiah, what is the suffering servant passage? I think it starts at Isaiah 40, and it goes to Isaiah 53. And Jesus Christ, that's a prophecy of the suffering servant. Jesus Christ, he's the suffering servant, they call it. And it, Jesus Christ came as a servant to serve us, to serve the Father, and he suffered in our place. By in doing that, he served us, and he served the Father. So it was for the benefit of these slaves that they continue obeying this command because Paul, as we saw, teaches them in Colossians 3, 24 and 25 that they will receive the reward of the inheritance if they do so. And if they fail to do so, the implication is they would lose the reward of this inheritance. Now, Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 and Colossians 2, 5, what do those verses teach us? Well, Paul in those verses affirms that the Colossian Christian community was faithful to the gospel. So this command here was something they were already doing, and he is simply reminding them to continue to, keep, to, continue to do it. So they were a faithful church. They were confronted with false teaching, the Judaizers who tried to put them under the law, but they were, had not given in to those teachings, as we pointed out in Colossians chapter 2, our study. So they were a faithful church, and they had many uh, slaves, slave masters, uh, uh, in the church, and so they were a great testimony at this particular time. So therefore, Colossians 3.23 is ad addressing again the motivation behind Paul's command in verse 22, which required that each of these slaves continue making it their habit of obeying their human masters, submitting in each and every circumstance. Don't miss that. Uh, look at uh, my translation, please. Colossians 3.22. Colossians 3.22, slaves, each of you continue making it your habit of obeying your human masters, submitting in each and every circumstance, not only while being observed as people pleases, but rather with a sincere attitude because each of you are characterized as possessing reverence and respect for your true master. Then look at verse 23 in relation to it. Whenever, whenever any of you at any time should do something, each of you from your entire being for your own benefit must continue to make it your habit of working hard as for your one and only true Lord, indeed never for people. So as I pointed out before, verse 23 is addressing the motivation for Paul's command, for obeying Paul's command in verse 22. They were not to obey only when being observed as people pleases, but rather they were to obey because of possessing a sincere attitude, being characterized by reverence and respect for their true master, Jesus Christ. So the spiritual principle that we see in verse 23 makes emphatic this command we just read in verse 22. It makes it emphatic. The former, verse 23, makes emphatic that their motivation must be their reverence and respect for their heavenly master, Jesus Christ. Now, uh, notice that in verse 23, Paul mentions these slaves as working hard and doing so from their entire being. What is Paul doing there? He's emphasizing that these slaves must give 100% effort because they possess the attitude and perspective that this service for their human masters was in reality on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason why is because ultimately they'll be rewarded at the Bama seat for this faithful service to their human masters. So uh, this is what we have going on here. So the, perspe uh, the, the perspective is everything. And he's telling them 100% effort. So what's the application for us? When you go to work, you shouldn't be one of these people that's late all the time. You know those people. You probably see them. They come into work late, and they're late all the time. And they're usually the first ones to leave. Okay? you gotta, you got to be uh, on time. And I always like to get there early, if I could. As early, you know, I, not an hour early, but some, get, you know, get there is early, a little bit early. And I, sometimes I got there a lot early if I had to do some work to clean up some stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, if you, you got to do 100% effort. And, again, not when the boss is in the, in the building or your manager's in the building, 
But when they're out of the building and they can't see you, you should still be doing, working hard. You shouldn't have your feet up on your desk, uh, taking it easy, or goofing off and talking. You know how those people are. You probably see these people at work. They're always taking breaks, going out to smoke or something, take a break. And they take more time out in the break room or smoking a cigarette than they do work. Or they talk. You know, those people who come up to your cube and they blah, 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 blah. It's like, hey, I got work to do here. I don't, have, I don't want to sit here and talk about the ball game for, you know, last night for a half an hour. I don't have the time, you know. So we can't be, we got to be people who are conscientious in our jobs. And, uh, the, uh, and it's very difficult to do that uh, because uh, when we have a job we don't particularly like, and uh, we don't, the boss is not very good to us. They could be a bad boss. And, you know, I've had those situations. So that's when it's a real challenge. But that's when this, what Paul's teaching this, uh, us here in Colossians 3, and 23, is going to give us the strength to get through this difficult situation in this particular job that we're in. Because if we do the best we can and work hard and uh, give our best effort as being commanded to these slaves in the Colossian Christian community, and if we work hard in our jobs that we're uh, having a difficult time in, God, you know, says, hey, I'll reward you. So don't miss this. Your job, you and I getting paid in our jobs, right? Only you're working for Jesus Christ now. Since you became a Christian, you are now, uh, you might work for Rockwell, you might work for some other place, or whatever it is, you know, uh, Staples or Costco or Walmart or whatever. I don't know what stores are out there. Or you work for Apple computers or Microsoft or Google. Whatever you work for, whoever you work for. You now work for Jesus Christ as a believer. You now work for Jesus Christ. So therefore, Paul's spirit-inspired teaching of the gospel that we see here in Colossians 3, 22 through 24 as I mentioned earlier, transformed the slave-master relationship in the Roman Empire in the first century since it taught the Christian slave that they were ultimately serving the Lord Jesus Christ and not their human slave masters. For them, this, their position as a slave had been transformed by their union and identification with Jesus Christ and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father. Now, being a slave had meaning and had purpose and now it gave dignity to even the most menial task. Now listen to me. Wouldn't this be, you know, you talk about, you know, things that we need to help the economy in America. You know what would really give a shot in the economy? If the, ch if, if the church was doing what Paul says here in Colossians 3.22 and 20-24. And we evangelize people. Think of all these people. If we were all doing what the word of God says here in this country, it would be a boom to the economy. Because we, a lot of people lose a lot, a lot of companies, a lot of business lose a lot of money from bad employees <laughs> and, they, you know, and different problems with employees. They, lose, they have all kinds of problems and, 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 and uh, this would change everything. Because if everybody's doing, working hard in their jobs, it's just going to be, and the, and, the, and the bosses were being fair with their employees, as the word of God says to do. We, this, this would transform the country. It would transform the economy. So now, being a slave had meaning and a purpose. Now, I look at, I used to, when I'd go to work, there were some people you come in, you could always tell it was Monday morning. They're dragging in, and they weren't, didn't want to be at work, you know. And I'd sit there and go, you know, huh. And... I would, I, to, to me, every day was the same thing. It was the same day to me and because of the word of God. The word of God gave me the, the strength to go, Monday's Monday, okay? I'm working for the Lord, and it transformed me as an employer where now Monday, I'm not, I'm not going to get depressed because it's the first day of the week, the beginning of the week, and, oh, you know, I got this whole rest of the week to go. I took it one day at a time and just concentrated on that day Try to do what God says, apply, do my job, and try to do my job as on the Lord as he says. Give my best effort, okay? Now, it, tr it gave me meaning and purpose to get up in the morning, to go to the job, even though the job might not be something that was fulfilling, and it was, maybe it was boring. You know, maybe it was one of those jobs that you had no choice, you wa watched the clock because it was not a lot of work, okay? So it, that transformed the employer relationship, employee-employer relationship for me.
So, again, this is the other thing. What Paul's teaching the Colossians here, the gospel gave dignity to the Christian slave for the most menial task that they might perform. The gospel promised these slaves that they would be rewarded by Jesus for faithful service to their human slave master. So slavery need not be drudgery and toil and a hopeless situation. And the same thing with a job. And here in the 21st century as, an, as a Christian employee, our jobs need not be drudgery and toil and hopeless. We don't have to have that perspective anymore. We don't have to be a slave to the circumstances. Look at God's word. So if these slaves trusted in this teaching from the gospel, their position of a slave would provide them satisfaction and even enjoyment, knowing that they would be, or in reality, serving the Lord Jesus Christ, who would reward them for faithful service and working hard for their human slave masters. Indeed, for the Christian slave, the gospel transformed their slavery into an act of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And consequently, the gospel not only transformed the slave-master relationship from the perspective of the slave, but think about it from the perspective of the slave-master, because it required that the slave work hard and be conscientious in their service as a slave. So what employer or what slave master wouldn't want their slave or their employee working hard? The gospel's telling the employee to work hard. What uh, the best thing, uh, the, the best friend of the economy in America is a Christian who is working hard for the Lord. And what, what's, what owner, what employer, what slave master in the first century wouldn't want a slave or employee who works really hard for their entire being? This is a, it, would be, it, it transformed the, the, the relationship between the slave and the slave master from the perspective, not only of the slave and how they were to do their task, but also the slave master. And it, 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 it caused a lot of slave masters to become Christians because of the slave. Hold your place. We started this last week. Look at Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. A parallel passage. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Ephesians 6, 5. Slaves, obey your human masters. I'm reading from the Net Bible in case you're wondering. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Not like those who do their work only when someone is watching, as people pleases, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Notice that you could, you could be a good, a good worker at work, working hard, and you're doing God's will. Verse 7, obey with enthusiasm as those serving the Lord, not people. So in other words, when the boss asks you to go do something, don't go. You know, with a bad attitude, dragging the broom with you. Or you're a kid, you know, and your parents say, ah, oh, I want you to do this, and you go. I remember my father would go, mow the lawn. Oh, you know. I used to drive him crazy with my attitude. But, so if we're do, if we, if, if we, if we're doing our job as under the Lord, working hard, we'll obey with enthusiasm. Why? Because we know what we're doing here. Basically, Jesus is asking us to do this. In reality, that's what's going on here. So he says, in verse 7, obey with enthusiasm as those serving the Lord, not people, because you know that each person, whether slave or free, if he does something good, this will be rewarded by the Lord. And something good is doing your job with 100% effort and working hard. Masters, treat your slaves the same way, giving up the use of threats, because you know that both you and they have the same master in heaven, and there's no favoritism with them. Now, in the first century, slavery was a major institution. The Roman Empire's economy was very much dependent upon it, okay? We don't know exactly how much, but it had to be significant, because you had at least 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Now, you think about this. What the gospel did for the Roman economy, the Roman Empire's economy, by Christian masters being fair to their slaves, and the slaves working hard for their bosses, their slave masters, as for the Lord, that had to transform the Roman Empire's economy. 
It had to because it affects everything that goes on in life, karma and everything. So go back now to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. So Paul wanted the slaves in the Christian community in Colossae to therefore live out the gospel in their lives, just like he wanted the Ephesian Christian community slaves to do the same. He wanted these slaves to stand in stark contrast to the non-Christian slaves in the Roman Empire. And here's the, here's the application for us. God wants us as Christians to stand out from our non-Christian fellow employees or students or whatever, neighbors. He wants us to stand out from them. We need to show that this is what attracts Christian. This is what's great about one of the things that's great about Christianity is that if we live out the gospel, it attracts people. It will get the attention of people. And that's what it did in the first century. Non-Christian masters could be led to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as the direct result of these Christian slaves being trustworthy and honest and hardworking and conscientious. I worked for a guy who's an NEC dealer. I've told you about this guy in the past. And uh, I don't think he's alive anymore. I heard from his brother who was younger than him. And they ran a company, they had an NEC deal, a computer company. And he... Uh, he would ask me questions all the time. Where are you going tonight? And I'd go to Bible class, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night, Sunday morning. And he said, you know, you're going to go to, you go every night. He said, yeah, this is, I love it. It's a, it's a blast. I enjoy the word of God. The guy's a good, good teacher. And so um, he ended up, he, he liked what, you know, he liked me, what I was doing for him, working for him. And eventually he came around, he went to Bible class with me. Him and his brother, I took, my, took him to my Bible, Bible, one of my Bible classes one night. So, and why, why did he do that? He liked me and he liked what I was doing for him. So, by, what I'm saying is by living out the gospel in my work, I'm telling you it's possible that you could get your bosses saved or at least come to a Bible class or people you work with. I, I told you this before. I, 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 I'd be talking to people. Somebody, my boss would ask me questions or something about Christianity. Sometimes I'd be in the lunchroom and there's a lot of people and I'm not really keen on that. You know, I found out a couple of years later when I left, you know, they, we left, I left that company and uh, they went on to do something else. I remember I ran into another guy, a guy who used to work for us and he came up to me and says, you know, I'm saved now. And he said, you used to listen to when I used to talk to this other guy in the, in the, at work at lunchtime. I was like, really? I was like, do you think, you, you might be addressing this person here, but another person is listening to you, or they see you and your job and how you do your job, this guy is getting saved. I never knew until a couple of years after that that took place. And he was, I never knew what he, what he thought about it. But it was getting him. God, the Holy Spirit was convicting him. God can, what I'm saying is God can use you and might be using you right now at school or in your job right now. You don't even know it. You might not see the fruit of it, the Bama seat, or you might see God might give you a glimpse of it to encourage you later on down the line when somebody says they got saved because they, you know, they were impressed by the way you did your job and they knew you were a Christian. You went to Bible class and stuff and you knew your Bible. So you never, people are watching. They're watching on your job. The bosses are and the employees are. You might not think so, but they're watching. So many non Christian masters in the first century would never step, fo step foot in a home where the gospel was taught and practiced. However, by Christian slaves demonstrating their obedience to the gospel, resulting in their being trustworthy with their master's affairs, these slave owners might give the gospel a hearing or simply believe in Jesus Christ as a result of their slaves' trustworthiness and conscientiousness and doing their jobs. Christian employees today in the 21st century we need to do the same as Paul instructed the Christian slaves to do in the first century. Non-Christians not only need to hear the gospel people, but they need to see it lived out in our lives. It's not simply enough to put your bumper sticker saying, I'm a Christian. You know? It's not enough to play Christian radio. At, you know? It, that's, that's not enough. Oh, well, you're good that you listen to great. It's more important that we live these, our, uh, the word of God, practice it in our jobs, our homes, our families, our relationships with people. Live it out. Pract apply what we're learning in Bible class. And, bring and listen to me. Nobody 
is perfect in doing this, and we're sh sure we're going to fail. And there are many times I can, I can tell you in my past, in my jobs, where I failed. Okay, I remember one time this boss was just writing me about something. I just got, you know, I just, you know, got mad at her. It was in private, and I felt bad the next day. And I went in to apologize to her, but she was way out of line. I put up a lot of stuff, but I still was wrong to lose my te my temper with her. So she just, I just cracked, and I was felt terrible when I went home that night. I was like, oh, I can't believe I did this because I wanted, you know, so badly to give a good testimony, but I said, you know what? All I can do is apologize to her, and I don't particularly care for her, but, you know, I'm going to apologize and do the right thing and move on and try not to let her get to me. Let me, let, let me, don't, try not to let myself be uh, um, tempted into getting angry with her, you know, not let her dictate my happiness, okay? So we as Christians need to be trustworthy and conscientious employees who work hard for our employers. Conscientiousness is a good word. You know, you, you're doing the job and you care about what you're doing. You're not doing less than 100% effort. My father has another expression, I won't use it in church. Half you know what. So he used to, you know, all know that. And that's, you know, my dad used to say, you know, when you're doing something, you know, he taught this when we were kids, we work with him at the bowling alley. You know, we, 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 you know, we're talking, right? And one of us stops and he go. Can't you work and talk at the same time? Well, literally, Billy, when you're in a job, you can't. You got to get the job done. You can't just stop. You do what you're doing. And I'm here. I'm ten. I'm like nine, ten years old. Here, okay, you know, you got to You got to work and talk. Okay, all right. I didn't do that. <laughs> like, but it, it was just you, you know. And he, and he said, you you know, when you're doing something, you got to do you know do your best effort. You know, it's interesting. What, what if we all everything we ever did and we were supposed to put our name on it? Would be in, would we just try to imagine, okay, okay, I'm doing this thing here. Now I have to put my name on it. Would you be proud of it, the work you're doing? Or are you going to say, I wouldn't put my name to it. If you're not willing to put your name and your reputation to it, you need to do a better job, you know? So that's why, hey, this is what one of the things used to drive me crazy at the other place and ch with churches is uh, people who are doing stuff in the church, and they don't do a good job. They, you can't count on them. I remember you used to have prep school teachers. And, the, you know, I had this at, at GBC when I was at GBC where I was ordained. People just not show up. Well, at least give me a call. Say you can't go. And just not show up. See, that's not being conscientious. That's not thinking of other people. That's just being selfish and, I don't, and, and, and not having any responsibility. And people, you know, one of the reasons why, like, with Titus, Titus is like wicked conscientious. I can, I can sit there and go, any, any problem with a computer, thing, I, he could solve it. I just have totally confidence in him. I give him a, he, he gets a job and he does it and, and he doesn't, you know, you don't have to sit there and wonder if he's going to, you know, do a good job. He does a really good job. And that's what he does. He can see when he trains Tyler and Cheyenne to, to step in when he's out of town or something to do the sound recordings. He makes sure that they're doing it and doing a, a good job and, and because that's how he is, and that's how he trains his kids to do that. Jody's the same way, you know? And uh, it's, it's, it's so, and, and I know, I'm sure Bill and Crystal are the same way, too. <laughs> but that's very, very conscientious. <laughs> What's that? Oh. So, so conscientiousness is a good thing to be. <laughs> now, the Christian's godly conduct, we'll close with this. The Christian's godly conduct is what makes the gospel attractive to the non-Christians. When the Christian's actions and words agree, the message is loud and clear, people. The non-Christian sees the truth and power of the gospel through the godly conduct of the Christian employee and employer. So, as we close, this fifth class condition in Colossians 3.23 also echoes the one that appears in Colossians 3.17 with the former, verse 23, specifically applying the latter to the slaves in the Colossian Christian community. Don't miss that. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 in my translation. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Look at Colossians 3, 17. I'm reading from my translation. Indeed, whenever any of you at any time should do something... Whatever, anyth whatever, anything, by means of a word or by means of an action, each of you must continue to make it your habit of doing each and every one of these things in a manner consistent with the Lord's name, who is Jesus. 
Simultaneously, each of you continue to make it your habit of giving thanks to the one and only God who is the Father through him. Now look at verse 23. They sound familiar. Whenever any of you at any time should do something, each of you from your entire being for your own benefit must continue to make it your habit of working hard as for your one and only true Lord, indeed never for people. You can look at it in the Net Bible. Look at these verses in the Net Bible, the way they, they're set up. Colossians 3.17. You can notice it. Whenever you, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then it says in verse 23, whatever you're doing, work at it with enthusiasm as to the, to the Lord and not for people. So what we see here is that the principle in verse 23 would prompt these slaves in the Colossian Christian community to remember the spiritual principle in verse 17, which was given to the entire church. Now, verse 23 emphasizes the motivation for anything in life, whereas the latter, verse 17, emphasizes the holy standards of the gospel, the Lord's name, which you do everything is unto the Lord, the name of the Lord. And so the, the verse 17 emphasizes the holy standards of the gospel, which the Christian must conform to when performing any activity in life. In other words, what I mean by that, as we saw in verse 17, in the Lord's name, in the name of the Lord, that means according to, to, to the, the Lord's character, His reputation, uh, uh, what He did for us. He saved us. He, uh, we, we're identified with Him in His death and resurrection. Let's live in a manner that's consistent. Let's live this way, do our jobs in a manner that's consistent with who God made us to be. He made us to bring glory to Him. Well, we're not going to bring glory to God in our jobs if we're not conscientious and we're lazy. All right, or apathetic. We're going to bring glory to him. We're going to live in a manner consistent with who he made us to be in Christ if we're conscientious and hardworking in everything we do in life. Not just our jobs. It could be anything that we do in life. So this is the message that the Holy Spirit is giving to our church. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time, the study of word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us, rebuke us, and reprove us if necessary, instruct us in righteousness, encourage us to apply what we're learning here this morning. We thank you for this study in Colossians 3.23, and we thank you for your people that are assembled here this morning in the Thompson home and those who might be viewing or listening to this class live or at a later date through the recordings on the website. So, Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're going to take up our Sunday morning offering. Giggles up there. All right. All right, let's pray for this offering. Heavenly Father, we pray that this offering would be given out of proper motivation and obedience to Galatians 6.6, 6, that those who are taught the word of God to share all good things with those who teach them. We pray, Father, that it would produce many thanksgiving to you and be a blessing to your people because your son taught. It's more blessed to give than to receive. We pray, thank you for those who are faithful and with their finances and supporting this ministry. And we pray for this offering in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, I want to do as a, so, uh, as a uh, song for the offering while that's being uh, taken place. I'm going to do a song called You Were Mine. And where is that? One ninety four Cheyenne says. having a good time. Nathan. This is Pastor Bill. The reverb on my voice, they sound like the Lord. I don't think he has reverb on his voice, though. He doesn't need it. Talk to me last night. It's got to be a pig.
Crowd. 